<laughs> well, speaking of your early MMA career then, because, you know, you like you said, when you first started, you didn't really know what you were doing for the most part, or nobody did. And then you did move to a major camp. Uh, you did get to train with Jackson Wink for a while, I think for the remainder of your MMA career as well. Mm -hmm. That's where you were. So talk to us about one, you know, that transition from what the hell's going on to you know, a dedicated training room with a lot of high level fighters, um, the culture of the, the differences in culture from that, the differences in methodology and how you approach things and learning about the fight game as well. Well, I mean, there's been times when uh, quite recently, when people are trying to do histories of the sport, where it was like, I just don't want to talk about that gym. I don't want to talk about those people, which is um, a discredit maybe to the past and some of the incredible things that happened for me mm -hmm. from them but everything changes and sure. my perspective on so many things changes. And so, you know, you can look at maybe some of my early interviews at that time. You can look at some of my later interviews at that time. And, you know, it was definitely what I would say. It was a step toward professionalism that I'd never experienced before. Um, and I would not give up having gone through that experience for the world. I would not wish some of the things that I went through on other fighters, um, and, and it's not that I trying to be coy or not give specifics. It sure. just seems like, it, it seems like speaking from a position of privilege and then saying, oh, poor me, but the bad things happened to me too. Oh, but I, you know, because I got so much there and what, what really stands out to me now when I think about it is what incredible women I got to meet along the way and I got to train with along the way and wherever they are, you know, I mean, if you know me on the internet, you know, I am, I am a political radical left wing socialist, crazy ass feminist bitch or whatever, you know, however people are going, I'm sorry if we're not supposed to swear on this. I didn't ask. Um, but you know, you'd like. Okay. But it's just like, that's actually, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I know I have that persona and sometimes I adopt that persona, but it's also because I really quelled a huge part of that when I was in the height of my MMA career. Maybe not well, but I really held back a lot of thoughts and opinions and things because I thought it was the right thing to do. And I was trying to fit into a mold that would make me look good for the people around me. And that's, I think everybody goes through that. I don't think that's a unique experience at all. But coming on the other side of it, I might be a little bit louder, a little bit cruder, a little bit, you know, coming into your own, you always kind of you're always a little bit rough around the edges. And I think I probably will be for life. I think that's my brand. <laughs> so, you know, what I will say is like, I had extraordinary moments and, and, you know, again, we can put this beautiful rose colored glasses idea about the whole thing um, and say that, oh, it was the golden time for Jackson's MMA. It was this and it was that. I mean, I was there from 2007 to 2013. So right when, Diego Sanchez had just gotten off the Ultimate Fighter 2, right when um, George St. Pierre won the title, right when, you know, it, it was becoming the mega camp, the, you know, mm -hmm. number one, like kind of maybe falling into the role that Militich used to have, that um, ATT was building toward, that, you know, AKA had somewhat, and I'm sure I'm leaving out other teams and everybody's going to, well, I don't think anybody listens to what I say. So, anyway, so that's, that's kind of good too. <laughs> so I could just talk all the shit, but, um, but you know, there, it was an extraordinary time to be there. Um, and I got to be a fly on the wall for some of MMA's most significant moments during that time. And that was an incredible thing. Um, the thing is, if you're a fighter, you should be a selfish human being. And I'm definitely a selfish human being. I definitely was then. You don't actually want to feel like a fly on the wall. You sort of want to feel like you're part of it and that you're not the support staff for a bunch of other people's dreams. And it's not that I didn't go after my dreams because I did. It's not like I wasn't supported going after my dreams To because in certain aspects I was. But I do feel like well, you know, read the book. I mean, <laughs> if I ever finish it, you know, it's just like, it, it's, it's, we, we've all got our own perspectives on it. And I'm sure people will just be like, she's full of shit. She's, you know, she's jealous, little this, that, and the other, but it's like, no, I, I had my dreams and I had my experiences and I will never not be grateful, but I will also never not be aware. Well, I wouldn't say never not. I am now aware having undergone extensive therapy and growth as a human being, you know, what, I actually myself sacrificed um, in order to be a fly on the wall. And that, that's a tough, 
you know, it's a tough thing to reckon with. I think that was pretty rambling. I'm sorry. No, that was a really interesting and a very unique perspective and definitely not an answer that I was expecting because, <laughs> uh, you know, that was, that was something different than, than most fighters would have answered probably. And I actually really appreciate that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I had better training than I'd ever had in my life. I had more, I mean, if you want the, the physical part, better training, better opportunities, more access to more mm -hmm. things than so many other people. And I know coming into that gym and where I was and my position in the gym, it's not hard to speculate with the rumors. Pretty much all of them are true about me and, you know, where I was. It, it, it's, it, but it's also like, I sacrificed a great deal of things that I didn't know I was sacrificing when I was there and when I was doing that. And I'm not saying other people don't sacrifice. Of course. And I'm not saying I wasn't lucky or privileged, but I am saying it was fucking hard. And and you don't even realize the toll that it takes until you come out of it. And you're like, I wow, <laughs> what was I doing? <laughs> yeah. So and, you know, and the funny thing is the fighting was the relief, except the losing. I did feel such a horrible, horrible sense of letting everyone down it was so devastating to me to not be the one winning and I never I mean I won a lot but I wasn't the one who was winning I wasn't you know the golden child or anything like right. that I was more like the propaganda child <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> you know in retrospect I'm like damn Julie like oh yeah next question is a bit more of a touchy subject um, mm -hmm. as it relates to WMMA specifically compared to the men um mm -hmm. fighter coach relationships um and how we see some examples of to be very vague less than savory behavior with coaches and fighters and those kind of things so my question is you know what are your feelings on in general and so what are your thoughts in general about that kind of stuff? well i mean you just dug out my secret right i mean that's that's the story of me at jackson's isn't it yeah but and it's like it's not that like i i i thought that i was the only well i was convinced from my coach that I was the one, the only one, or nobody knew, mm -hmm. and that I was keeping it. It's like everybody can see that. But it, it, beyond that, like whatever, that's like uh, it's 2022. Like that all ended a while ago. Mm -hmm. But it did. It had a detrimental effect on my career. Did it have a good yeah. effect on my career? Probably, yeah. But it is there is a power dynamic that you don't even know is happening because you feel like you have this kind of power and you feel like you've got this insight and this person has an insight into you. But in the end, they're the ones who are supposed to be telling you what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. And no matter how you think that's not gonna bleed into a personal relationship or a personal relationship is not gonna bleed into what's going on in the mats, you're crazy because fighting is personal. We can all say this is a professional thing and it's not an emotional thing and everything like about every fight. And that's great. I'm sure that kind of, um, that what those goggles really work for some people really work well, but it's not true. You are a person fighting when you're fighting. You can say, yeah, I'm a machine. I'm this, I'm a monster, I'm an animal, but no, you're a human being, you're a person fighting and you're gonna carry the weight of you know what's going on in your life with you. So no, I, I think it's bullshit. And, I, I know every time I say something like that, somebody's going to come up with 14 million statistics of where it works or this worked and this mm -hmm. worked. No, keep it out. Just don't do it. Or if you're going to do it, you better find other coaches to trust. Mm -hmm. Like you got to find something outside of that. You're going to things that are going to, they're going to help you and protect you because a, a coach may have a relationship with a fighter and try their best and say the entire thing's professional and do everything within their power to try to make it that way but it's not going to be that way it's just not they have power over you so i'm not a fan i will go on record saying i'm not a fan of it and as many female fighter or male fighter enemies and whatever how whatever the dynamic is you know that i make from that that's fine you know we all have our own perspective we all have whatever we went through that goes through it but i've seen i've seen it i've been there I've, it's just not, it does not end well for people. There's, there's just too much resentment. If a fighter wins and wins and wins, somehow it always ends up, no matter what the coach says, it always ends up being the credit on the coach. Yeah. I, I guess what I'm saying is it's dangerous. It's dangerous for mm -hmm. both people. It's more dangerous for the fighter. You're losing a part of yourself. And as much as you think that you're gaining, you're probably not. And maybe there are fighters out there who, 
you know, have relationship with their coaches, everything works out well and they get married and everything's this, that, and the other, but you have to have something outside of yourself and what you hold dear to you and what you hold personal to you. And if you don't hold fighting personal and dear to you while you're doing it, I don't know why you're fighting. Um, I mean, you can hate it and it's still a huge part of your emotional identity. Like you can absolutely hate fighting and still have to do it because you love it. But whatever it is, you have to have a voice outside of that. Somebody who is not close to that and who can see a bigger picture. And I just don't think that happens when coaches and fighters are involved. I don't. Um, prove me wrong or don't. I don't care. Like, totally I just, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't care. Like, do it. Like, whatever. Great. From mm-hmm. henceforth, maybe all coaches and fighters are going to be. I just don't. I don't think it works. I think it's really dangerous for fighters. Sure. So, yeah. 